I'm Chris Gaynor. Good evening. Uh, welcome to Sarah and to this evening's lecture by the architect and educator Toshiko Mori. Toshiko's work presents us with a determined and precise assault on the conventionally constructed physical forces in architecture. An examination of new materials and processes, the built projects consist of a series of compelling and elegantly executed private and public projects and they've become the instrument of insurgency against an architectural history that is conventionally portrayed as cast only in stone, steel, glass, and concrete. In these works, Toshiko Mori induces a strain of new materials to build a strategic advantage for new construction, relying on the playfully and precisely softened, the elastic, the porous, and pliable. Toshiko Mori is a material iconoclast a position reinforced by a now renowned research practice. In these deep researching efforts, the material becomes a conceptual subversion of the conventional through a tenacious reliance on the experimental, on the open-ended affirmation of the act of learning through observation, and on a kind of intense and deductive appreciation for what materials of construction can offer to a new project of architecture. Her research bites together a generation of young academics and American architects, from which Toshiko's 2002 publication of Immaterial, Ultramaterial provides a critical framework for realigning the conceptions of the phenomenal and a deepened material-based practice a conversation to be extended in our upcoming publication, Textile, Tectonic, and Architecture. <clears throat> Toshiko Mori is the Robert Hubbard Professor of Practice of Architecture at the Harvard GSD, which was the chair from 2002 to 2008. She is the principal of Toshiko Mori Architect, which she established in 1981 in New York City. In 2003, Mori was awarded the Cooper Union inaugural John Hedick Award. In 2005, she received the Academy Award in Architecture from the American Academy of the Arts and Letters and the Medal of Honor from the New York chapter of the AIA. Mori has served on the board of Van Allen Institute and the Store Front for Art and Architecture and has been an advisor to the New York Foundation for the Arts as well as to publications such as A plus U. In addition, Toshiko Mori has the challenge and the honor of serving as vice chair of the Global Agenda Council on designing complex systems for the World Economic Forum. In closing, I would like to bridge back to a possible critical opening, a late 16th century cone box with designs of rabbits and waves that you see on the screen in front of you. This Hiramaki A is in the collection of the Tokyo National Museum. The box consists of a buildup of dozens of thinly applied layers of natural sap tree lacquer over a trellis-like weave of micro-thin bamboo thread substrate. The box is, according to its use, lightweight, portable, strong, resilient, and impermeable. A physical paradox underscored uh, by the efforts that to achieve these characteristics, the artisans were about to develop an immunity to, to the gradual exposure to the poisonous liquid of the lacquer. The lacquer itself would have been cured, bathed in an extreme environment of virtually 100% moisture, only to be polished to a mere finish with water and charcoal in a process that could have taken up to several years. All of this would hardly matter if the work wasn't a haptic tool de force. It is a phenomenal, a phenomenal invocation of lunar light as it's conjured by the depiction of the hairs, which according to legend lived on the moon. Indeed, the material conditions of the box transcends its making and momentarily invoke and bring the light of the light of the moon. Please welcome to Shikamura. I will just talk about a couple of my projects. Uh, one is um, the first project I will talk about is uh, the other fang. Thank you guys for knowing about Fang Roy Wright. He has also done a lot of work in California. Um, this is Fang Roy Wright's uh, Darby Martin House in Buffalo, New York. It was between 1904 and 1906. Uh, to me, it's one of the most significant houses he has done uh, next to Roby House in Falling Water. Um, and at that time, this was the biggest house and most expensive house built in this country. Gary Martin is paid from being the richest man, Bill Gates, on that day. And the project I'm showing is a visitor center for Frank Wright House. 
and it was a competition. And uh, I won it about five years ago. And Buffalo is not the wealthiest city, so it took him a long time to uh, purchase the purchase back the property, which was divided up, and restore, renovate, and so on. It has nothing to do with restoration, but that has much more. Um, how do I say, pro, uh, problematic issue of restoration reconstruction, but it's really had to do with the new building. The plan of Davi Martin House uh, is one of the most complex and most elaborate uh, residential compound, and Frank Lloyd Wright himself called it the opus, and he had it next to his drafting table all the time as he was referencing also his career. So this project was an incredibly intimidating task. I always say that building project next to or in reference to another architect is probably much more, it's not even probably, it is much more challenging in Africa as opposed to building completely new within your own context and program and so forth because you are, you are in constant conversation and dialogue with the work of an architect, with the history, with the legacy. And for me, the task is how do you re-interpret without imitating how do you make the project and legacy of Frankfurt right into the 21st century? So that's an incredibly loaded challenge for me. And I, I, I have to say that uh, historically, Frankfurt Wright was never against adding to the building of his, nor uh, building next to it, but as long as he did the work. So I always say that um, I was lucky he was already dead and I was doing this work. Otherwise, I would probably not in one piece today. But in a way, I was able to speculate a lot of his work. Uh, this building was quite significant for its time because if you study the plants very closely, there are no such thing as rooms, walls. It's uh, spaces uh, in floating in the middle of a series of piers. This is really the beginning of uh, open plan. And at that time, this was really not a European conception in terms of reverse, reverse history. Uh, Hector Berlaghi has come and seen this building and Latin building and lectured widely to Zurich. And then through him, Ms. Van der Rohe goes and learned about Frank Lloyd Wright. So in a sense, this was much before the European influence. And the Europeans have learned about a lot of us, uh, Frank Lloyd work and studied the plans. <coughs> And Davi Martin himself as a patron and helped uh, Frank Lloyd Wright uh, make and publish Wasper's portfolio in Germany uh, about 10 years after this particular uh, project. So I just want to point out the revolutionary aspect of this particular plan where I started out from. And the context of it, which I ended up uh, placing a project right here. This is is a Olmsted neighborhood, Parkside residence. It's a very delicate residential <coughs> residence, and the Dali Martin's house sits in a corner as a very large building, as you can see in the context. And uh, my building sits in a new site, which is acquired by them, this historic site, as this diagonal site, this one. And then this edge refers to this entire neighborhood this scale, whereas that it refers to the Dali Martin house itself. Um, here you can see the division of historical. So the task for me is to have a double reading of a site. In fact, how do you make historical site look independent of a new building, but at the same time, the entire site uh, cohesively looked at as a campus, a more integrated campus. So that's the siting uh, difficulties. And these are really the rationale of how I came up with particular proportion and dimensions of a project. They have this connect, this is a my Dami Martin house. The Martin house belonged to Dami Martin's sister and brother in law. Um, conservatory carries house in Pergola. And I did not want to have a direct reference to the house, but at the same time referring something. So I took the structural module of Pergola here, which is about seven foot seven in inches and projected that to make it a new module, structural module of this new visitor center, uh, making it refer to more of a landscape garden pavilion, so reference to a landscape rather than to the house itself. So that's kind of me of escaping the reference of finding another aspects of it. The building is diminutive, and it's low and horizontal. 
and from some perspective, you can have a seat. And uh, well, for uh, a historic, uh, this is a National Historical Landmark, it was quite important that it does coexist with it, but in a sense, it doesn't compete with it. But for me, it, uh, even though the size is very small, to have certain kind of monumentality, which it had to have to claim its own presence in such uh, amazing site in the next the building. And the uh, idea for me is to come up with a strategy of contrast. The front of my building has a hip roof, and this is a reverse hip. It's made out of a solid uh, Roman brick, and it's made out of three sides made out of glass. So I keep working out of the like, contrast with each other in terms of material the real building. Um, but at the same time, I work with the inherent concept in the house, which I showed earlier in terms of open plan series of piers that become generator of space. In this building, the piers work as structural elements, also infrastructure carrying gas, data, electricity, and also it has air systems in it, houses, books, and furniture. It has multitasking elements to this particular <coughs> pier system. And I have been, uh, these are the plans of it, and uh, I have used that as a beginning of a structural strategy, which has four central piers in a plan, and three-sided glass, and back is a casting place concrete volume, which has the houses of the mechanical utilitarian elements as such. And the profile of it is a uh, reverse hip, but also uh, angles, and so that it invites daylight. Buffalo has extreme climate in which there's only 20% 20, 20 of a year they have sunny days. It's more cloudy days than Seattle, Washington. So in the way of uh, maximizing daylight, it has a uh, skylight, it has this particular angles that uh, invites daylight in. This is another perception about it. And uh, this was the idea behind this particular uh, project. And uh, in terms of structure, most of the structure, uh, it, it's kind of uh, counterintuitive. The piers themselves, they are taking a lateral load, but most of the dead weight and light load are taken up by mullions, which I call it column, column mullions, but uh, it's, um, uh, it's about two inches by two inches solid standards, placed at seven foot seven inches. And these elements, which look like modules, are in fact structural uh, columns, which is uh, very supporting. Also, there are certain principles that I really wanted to literally demonstrate in this project, in which he always says the building grows out of a ground. That's a literal reference. But to distinguish glass brilliant from these vocabulary, uh, Ms. Vanderbilt's vocabulary or like the Johnson vocabulary, I really literally wanted to have a glass grow out. So the detail was pretty important for me because it's <coughs> triple glazing and the last was thickest glazing. Um, this is clamped here so that this entire glazing is 18 feet high. Is canopy but off the ground, and there's a space up here which is taking care of a really uh, uh, dimensional movement between structure and so forth. So, literally, all the glass is doing canopy but right out on the ground, and literally, it meets right up in this training system here, the sliding system here. So, this is kind of detail that I was very, very careful to figure out how to run this through. And probably one of the best panels, 18 feet. Tall, otherwise, there's only one another triple place the existing is of people installing and carrying through here. And uh, they actually plug it right to the clamp at the bottom and slide it up. So that's and so it's a, a couple of new channels really holding them together. It's really not a structural element at all. Um, we also worked out with a climate engineer. And Sona from Stuttgart, Matthias uh, Stuttgart, we worked together because one of the ideas for this pavilion is how to reinterpret organic architecture uh, in terms of a technical and technological innovation of our time, and of course, idea of sustainability 
is important, but at the same time, um, this is not very wealthy organization. They said, we really want the maintenance rebuilding. They said, deed is nice to have a plant, but we really want a building that really uses the least amount of energy, utility, electrical costs. So we really looked at it that way. And reverse hip proof um, accumulates snow. In Blackwell, there's eight to 10 feet of snow every winter. And we have a structure in here, SLM, SLM Chicago, have worked on it. And fresh snow is the best insulator. So snow is there when you really need it. And as I mentioned before, the winter low angle sun is introduced to the slope of the ceiling. Um, it's right by the Great Lakes, and prevailing uh, wind is always coming from west. So the black masonry wall is helping to mitigate the strong wind coming through. Uh, and it's insulating against the prevailing west wind. And snow like when there's a lot of snow, in fact, there's a lot of heat gain in this building. We have a radiant cooling heating in the slab, so this particular mechanism works as a heat sink, so that you know, during the daytime when there's a lot of heat gain, uh, it keeps the heat and then uh, uh, extra energy uh, harvested as a result, is even now at night time you need it. So we did a lot of uh, simulation and modeling of this project, and uh, operated by geothermal well, including uh, old building is totally done, and I have to say, Frank Boyd Wright, like Louis Kahn, has all these kind of servant spaces in which the lot of cavities, and especially you saw before, the uh, cavities in peer structure allow this geothermal system to work so very smoothly without having any duct work and so forth. Another consideration for us for geothermal is acoustical reasons. This is a residential neighborhood. We couldn't have a very loud a condenser going on in the neighborhood, so this is a very quiet system as, as well as in terms of um, energy investment. It was more expensive, but long-term use for this kind of project, they really save a lot of money that way. So we have a spaghetti work of, uh, this is a supplemental air unit uh, to take care of a triple glazing. And, uh, right, so I think these are some of the strategies we have geometry optimizes natural daylighting, uh, triple phasing the way more than 20 through columns, first floor is made in heating and cooling, and below slab we have displacement simulation, which is at the very bottom fresh air is brought in, and um, we also have a, a CO2 monitor, so when there's different type of occupation, uh, when there's a lot of people, we have more fresh air coming in, so it has very sophisticated monitoring systems going on. And uh, displacement ventilation works as a connection system. It just, uh, air is moved uh, on its own uh, rate without mechanical uh, things. So this under construction is uh, steel. I wanted to have it carbon fiber, but it was very, very expensive. Um, idea was to make it like a sailboat by America's Cups, a sailboat maker, so there won't be any leak, because leak was always a Right, I was just told by my client, you can do building as long as there's no need. But we ended up with a more conventional system, but it really does uh, talk about uh, more creative use of distribution forces. It appears as a cantilever, but it really doesn't. So we did a lot of um, parametric simulation of loading conditions, information, so that uh, it's not really as you can see, it's stressed, but it's distributed so that uh, we were able to use minimum amount of stainless steel for columnar structure. And all the lighting, uh, we worked out lighting, is all diffused lighting, so it's all lit uh, from the bottom up. And lighting level is not as bright, but in a sense it's very unpleasant and very sufficient. And exhibitions in there has inked lighting also in terms of uh, atmospheric ideas and also Cost like that. So that's the building that you can see in it. Um, and also the facade acts as a lens for the Dari Martin House and one of all the visitor centers that you will go in there. And then once you go in there, you, you will pick frames the original building as if it's some another artifact. So reframing that is very important and also sort of elements of contrast. 
it has a relationship, it's oppositional, but at the same time there's some harmonious elements. But it's reinterpretation of uh, Frank Lloyd work, but it doesn't have any limitation aspects of it. As I mentioned, the back wall is a big long cast in case concrete, but it imitates the pat exact patterning and proportion of exterior wall. Uh, Frank Lloyd Wright uses uh, art dimension uh, Roman brick has a very deeply baked mortar joint, but he painted interior mortar joint gold, so that once you are inside, it has an effect of floating horizontal brick patterns. And it's a little bit like a palimpsest in a sense of memory of this particular exterior brick pattern. It's like a little bit what Rachel White had done. So this is a kind of effect we want to achieve in that, that wall as a reference element. Uh, this glass, has a holographic uh, projection on it, and it really it has a layer of film, projection of film, but it appears as completely transparent. And uh, introduction comes in, and all of a sudden the picture and projection of Frank Lloyd Wright ghostly images come through to the shops people, but at the same time, it works as architectural elements and also as a projection. And six screens, it goes through. You can do six simultaneous, you can do narration, linear narration. If they want to, they can broadcast the Buffalo Sabres game. <laughs> uh, so there's much more use for this particular kind of screen here. And that's what I was talking about building framing, the original building. And uh, the tables you see are uh, extensive exhibition material, which was a part of our campus, University of Buffalo. This David Martin wrote, was an accountant, and he was like a chief finance officer. He kept every single receipt, he kept every single correspondence. So this particular archive is, in this building is one of the best documented building in uh, America, at least some people see in the world. So we were able to have interesting and important documents in that as well. We were able to use the exhibit here, the night view of this. I'd like to also talk about a couple of buildings which I worked in reference to another artist, another architect. The second one is with Marcel Breuer. I didn't choose to do this, it just somehow accidentally came to my office. It just because if I wanted to choose to do it, I wouldn't do it because it's so tough. I previously I did addition to Paul uh, Woodrow's house and I said, that's enough. Frank Breuer has it, that's done, I'm so glad. And now comes Breuer. Breuer is a bit nicer than Frank Lloyd Wright, but he's still a very tough architect. And this was the original, uh, originally it was his own house. He lived and worked between 1951 and 75. And uh, as in many houses, this is uh, in New Canaan, in Connecticut, they call this area Harbor Five, five of the architect, including Phil Johnson, Lund, uh, Hoa, and uh, John Johansson. Uh, they have all worked and built what you call more experimental houses in there. So that's the house itself. And it has gone through many different owners and many different renovations. So if you look at any of the books of Broya, it shows up as a, a Broya house two or three in Canaan. It doesn't account for the major masterpieces just because of various remodeling it has gone through, but still a very significant, not only the Broya house. So this was in a bit of a jeopardy because this particular property was uh, put for sale. A developer bought it and he had a plan to have a function on, on it and to destroy his house. So my client had to put a stop uh, demolition order to town of New Canaan, bought back the property from the developer and asked me to restore, renovate, and add their new additions to it so that they can come and live in it. So this is a very much of a challenging task for us. And for Breuer's work, uh, as I think mentioned a little bit of front by by this way of selectively observing, analyzing the part of the architect and kind of make a strategy to add or restore or work on the building, I guess I call it regeneration how to work with historical architect, but not to make it totally historicist or the building of a past. I always think it's very important to 
update even go forward into the future. And for me, the space on the wall uh, was very important element, and this is uh, this was addition in the 70s, but it was very bad repair. I <coughs> took it down, and this was also addition of pool house, which I kept. So this selective idea of what to keep, keep and what not to keep. And what I did is made an addition here. In this strategy of having a right angle relationship for two rectangles is something Broya would do, but to distinguish the fact that it's not Broya geometry piece, the connection is in a different diagonal geometry or glass stair which connects these two buildings. And then this is updated, uh, renovated into a pool house. And uh, so that's the basic strategy for that. And what was interesting to me is to how to refer all of you. And this is a garage you will come in. And then once you get here, the landing is always in old housing, original housing. This was the original opening of the original house. And this became a landing. You always have to go through this landing to go upstairs. So family living is always going in between uh, new and old from the daily life as uh, one is practicing. The brought also idea of having, this is a reverse problem for me, for family wise house, in a way that the house is quite small, and that my addition is much bigger. And how to make this original house keep its monumentality and make my bigger addition look more diminutive. So the material of choice is uh, glass, but it has different gradation of transparency, translucency, opacity, and it has a irregular patterning devices so that it reflects and reflects in different way. The material has more mutable quality as opposed to much more solid, opaque, heaviness of a masonry structure. So by working this out, uh, I'm trying to give this building a weight and then making this building more lighter. And there's this existing side wall and the base of this new addition is exactly the same height as this wall, but with a different geometry, a horizontal type of geometry, masonry. And in addition, uh, my surgical intervention for the original house is in the roof plane. It's a very low house, it got incredibly oppressive, and also, this time I have to say, the roof was leaking, we had to completely build the roof. Um, also, masonry. Wall wasn't pretty bad shape, we had to rebuild a lot of it, so we basically had to do open heart surgery for this particular building. But also to add to the roofs a uh, clear, clear story and skylights, and then related to a new clear story which is facing north in this additional building, and relating to a material into glass connection between two buildings. So this is an intervention, and uh, that's a section, section street. And this is under construction. You can see the skylight through. If you're standing here, it is so uh, recessed that you really do not see it. But it's quite a large, about a uh, two foot high skylight, which gives a lot of daylight into a new project, uh, new, uh, new, newly restored house. Uh, this is idea of a mutable, different type of glass, which is reflective and it uh, diffuses the effects. And, um, but our also idea of a cantilever so that the volume uh, looks a little more suspended, again, the lightness against this heaviness, and one volume floating, and then I'm really grounded. So that, that particular idea of location of building in terms of ground plane gives the idea that a thickness and then a beautiful surfaces such as this. And top, the cantilever part is a master bedroom coming in room below. And we have used the Shuko system so that windows are punched into the glass plane instead of having another frame. And beyond it is a new frame for the uh, pool house. And we kept this data, this was original data of a roof, so we kept that intact so that there's always a reference of what was existing. So there's quite an amount of new intervention and, and radical intervention ceiling plane, but uh, existing walls are remaining as 
this, and we, we restore the flooring as well. So in a sense, envelope flooring and walls are what's been uh, pretty much intact in many instances. This is Changjo uh, between when you're coming up from a uh, garage and going upstairs. This is really a landing level of original house in some of the details. And this is a night view of uh, transitional space. So uh, one, one side of this glass is all opaque and translucent. Inside of it is all glass. You can actually see through two landscape elements, and, uh, like, like this one. But from outside, it's really nearly opaque. So you can have a privacy of one going through one place to the other. The juncture between is all in you. And this is a... Uh, Again, using some of the vocabulary you're familiar to, especially the handrails, are very Broya-esque. So in a sense, it's a reference to some details of Broya-esque, but building a new canopy over it for a new full house. <coughs> another project which is a reference to another artist in this case is Joseph and Annie Albers and uh, Bauhaus Major. I think the Bauhaus show just opened in New York yesterday, in fact, so I was just looking at again. Now, this exhibition is about Joseph Albers' furniture and Naki Albers' textiles. And uh, they live together, but they never collaborate together. So the challenge is how to display sets of work which had incredible visual relationship, but in fact was never collaborated. So uh, this was exhibition design at Cooper Hewitt Museum. And I worked very closely with Alba's foundation in terms of curation and display and arrangement of work by Jofis and Alba's. And um, the project I'm about to show is that uh, in Joseph Alba, Alba's foundation, they have archival buildings for Alba's paintings and works on paper, but they do not have any pavilion or archival facilities for precisely the body of work in this exhibition. Joseph Alba's furniture and Annie Alba's textiles. So uh, in the foreground here, if this is existing or open use uh, archive building is uh, built by design by Gil Prentiss. And I, I am posing a bar above the hill, this foundations outside of New Canaan, Connecticut. And then uh, this is a glass pavilion with uh, chambers of a different rooms, which houses uh, different works. One is uh, Annie's textiles, another room for Joseph's furniture, and another room is uh, works on paper, another room is study room. So four boxes are very different kind of conditions. And the zones in between, the glass area is really not conditioned. So in a sense, it's very hard in New England idea of having inside, outside, a model, modulated space. And as shape of a roof, uh, it kind of has this little bit of motif, like some of the weaving, some of the graphics of Joseph and the Alba's in, in relationship. What I want to achieve with this building is to have what you call a liminal zone between those climatically controlled uh, archive boxes in, within an envelope. And the distance between the envelope and the opaque facade will create a different type of illusion, like the illusion of Joseph and Alba's paintings, of having a different kind of depth, depth but, uh, perception, but also at the same time being able to flatten it. And uh, entry to this building is from below, so you will actually walk through, you will enter in from outside to below, and you slip inside of this pavilion. And uh, actually, in fact, this inside outside, outside spaces is where one would be in the nature and out of nature and also you be completely interior of some climate area. Um, I'm going to try sh to show some of the house project and this is related to this project a little bit because this is a highly curated house. And um, in terms of house project, it's upstate New York, uh, has a great view of the west, and it belongs to an art dealer. And in terms of curatorial aspects of this house, uh, we received a uh, list of objects in the house before the house plan was figured out. And at the same time, it's the family who 
really grew up with these artists like uh, Richard Longo, Anthony Gormley, uh, not Joseph Lewis, but not very dead, and uh, yeah, this is Peter Santo, uh, and Kosius, Hoza, Maria Nanovich. So the kids really grew up with these artists. So the challenge is to not to make it into a museum, but how to integrate these work of art, which the family owns. And in fact, the family invites all these artists for Thanksgiving dinners and so forth, how to make by intimate residential spaces while incorporating these art as an object. Um, the reference to them. And some of them are um, made these installations, and some of them are furniture, they collect for Kiamon. An idea for this house is to have uh, more of long, uh, collect more art is in a garden, also on the ground floor, which is glass pavilion. In private spaces upstairs is bedrooms, but also the heart of a house itself. And this is actually the heart of a house itself, the very central library on the floors, which I, can, I think we should be able to show. Exterior of the house is aerated aluminum, which is used for industrial acoustical purposes. And uh, this is used as main screen. And one of the reasons is that within this particular site, it has an uh, effect of being very shiny, but also bad. Uh, it changes with the different weather. And uh, also, it does, uh, it, it's very inexpensive, it turns out to be. And also has this effect of a mass very much interested in working. We just had to do a lot of study to make sure that birds don't have a nest and insects don't get in and live in there. So we had to do a lot of research with biologists about different habits of birds and bees and insects, but it turns out to be they really don't like aluminum, so it turns out to be a bit of material for that. And that's that nearly completed here. You can see uh, uh, Gomley's uh, sculpture, a principally looking landscape here. But quite a spectacular sight. So I think actually what was interesting for me is to have a two volume, which is one of the transparent volume, which is one side a uh, solid volume, which looks very heavy, maybe can't be by an offset against that. And another house uh, also I've been working on, it's really completed, is this house, again, upstate New York, but it has a very difficult site, which is bridged, bridged between two promontories on one, uh, this rock and another rock. And again, it's in precipitous uh, location. And uh, it is a series of houses that I've been working on double, double volume, which shifted volume, which is taking place. But in fact, this building, these bridges, which goes between two rocks, also work the structure for these two volumes because it's a very precipitous site. And some part of the volume is hang, lower volume is hanging on top of it, the upper volume is built on top of it. And so this kind of shows how, uh, in a sense, this lower volume is uh, half suspended of it. And that's a bridge which is becomes the first structure to go on it. The other uh, parts of the building being suspended. Um, I will show uh, one, two more houses just so, because I think I work, uh, houses are very interesting for me as a program and in terms of how to work in terms of site. This is right on Hudson River and it looks at West Point. And it's a very simple strategy, it's a crucifix plan and a floor floor is a living room open floor and it's rotated 90 degrees is a bedroom volume above it and this is for a single uh, woman doctors and, and she doesn't have family except that she has four trees that she's very very attached to so there's four trees <laughs> uh, so we had to have a greenhouse so, we did, so this was like finding four trees is my program it's strange but uh, green roof, very careful about uh, lighting strategies, uh, daylighting, and filtration of clean air. Uh, so uh, 
Again, it's a simple strategy of having one volume straddle over another. And that's a cantilever is have bedroom and also very shiny strata below for outdoor dining room, which is a great view of the Hudson River. As you can see from inside, that's a room for this. Trees are a little suffering right now. I think it's getting used to this particular condition right now. And last project, just uh, in terms of houses I'm showing, is uh, a very extreme program in which my client wanted to have seven different buildings. And the idea is near, nearly curating a lifestyle, but they have a place they sleep in this here. This is eating pavilion, media pavilion, and that's an artist studio. This is a spa. This is a guest bedroom, and that's a parking garage. So in a way, it's extremely a glass house, but in a sense, instead of having one large house, they decided to have a seven small pavilions, which is uh, scattered throughout the site. And this we are working on the planning site while it's working on it. So this was a very interesting idea for me to really look at when I was interested in glass houses, glass house paradigm, looking at museum details and Philip Johnson going back to um, having to come up with a new type of paradigm for this type of house. I think I'm probably going into more detail of this. Uh, in fact, uh, glass goes all the way from a floor to a ceiling, so it's a total glass box and floor and roof are inlaid inside of it. It's a total clean glass box and its variations there of this particular thing throughout. I have to say, this is an extreme client who wants to go outside in the middle of winter and go eat dinner and come back and go outside and go to take a bath and come back. So I don't recommend this for everybody, but it's, for me it's a great project to be working on. I will show two small mobilium projects uh, because and then I think two larger projects uh, toward the end of the lecture. And uh, this is a pavilion, a newspaper pavilion in China which is south of Shanghai. Uh, master plan is made by Ai Weiwei, an artist in Beijing. It's because his father is a very well-known poet and novelist is from this town. He's built a, a monument for his father right there. And then Hoseok in Jinglong commissioned to do a large uh, scale master plan on that side of the river. And the other, all cities, this particular the other side of the river, so this is and he invited 17 architects from China and uh, all over the world. I think from the US, it's just me and Michael Mozart. I think that's Michael Mozart's book for me to sell. And this is a public project for government of Tsinghua. And uh, in China, there are many parks, but none of them are occupiable, meaning that people can't sit there and use it. So Ai Weiwei's idea is to come up with what he calls micro-urbanism, small pavilions, instead of having one large building, disperse them. 17 have people do a lot of little buildings. So that contributes to micro-economy, can be used for people, everyday people who actually live in it. So uh, otherwise, this particular site would have been a fade to solve the development from a gigantic housing build on it. So that's part of his way of preserving something and doing something planning very different from it. And my project was a newspaper pavilion, newspaper stand, small one. Uh, traditionally, uh, they have a wallpaper in China, and uh, traditionally people will go and look at the news in community centers. Also, uh, even today, people are too poor to buy newspapers, so that reasons, if you go to any town, they always display these newspapers on the wall. So that's idea that came to mind. Also, this is right in Beijing's use of the propaganda materials. There's usually a speaker and kind of communist uh, propaganda is always broadcasted from newspaper pavilion. So in terms of idea of media, it's kind of struggling either one or the other. And uh, it's located right at the main entry. And uh, my pavilion is very small. And you walk up the ramp here and ramp up there. So on the top of the roof to the lookout, you can come from uh, the other side, and you can actually also go up to 
by the steps to the roof also. And next to it is Ivy Bay's museum there. Um, so there's kind of a series of pavilions which is sprung up like a necklace of series of pavilions there. And uh, it's operated by, it's going to be operated by one or two people. It's coffee shop, ice cream shop, so that it become a place of gathering, which again, I very dissident agenda. It's not something government wanted to, but he wanted to have a gathering space so that there will be a team and people will be coming together right next to the entrance. And also, for the facade, I wanted to have a display of newspapers. And I was saying uh, freedom of media, but I was told it's not a good idea to talk about that in China. But idea is to hope is to be able to display newspaper from all over the world. But to convince the government, uh, China is incredibly literate to culture. People are reading all the time, high rate of literacy. There's more than 2,500 trade, like 3,000 local newspapers. So I said, this is the way to display the paper from all regions. In this one little Korean can have like a 2,500 newspaper. So, um, I was able to divert this danger of saying it meaning uh, freedom of media, but it became a propaganda for literacy rate and high uh, degree of publication. Journalism in China also today headlines are the same, but hopefully that uh, something will evolve into it. It's a very tricky kind of agenda of working studies. And uh, it's built, it's in a sense very rough in China, but in a sense that's how we have to work so certain roughness, and they are trying to put all the papers together in the opening day. And uh, it's, it's, a real, it's a small building. I mean, that's a lot of process with little boys, so it's very small. <laughs> uh, another pavilion I'm working on in New York City is for a pool park in Grand Concourse. And uh, this building here, this was a cottage, the last cottage that Edgar Allan Poe lived. He wrote Annabelle Lee here, and uh, that's where his wife died. And uh, it's, it was the last residence of Edgar Allan Poe. So it's a historic building, but not too many people know that it exists. And uh, there's a historical cyber park, but also it has a very lively jazz bandstand here. So in a sense, this particular park is completely opposite side of very lively contemporary jazz festival taking place, and then more contemporary with historical society. So a project for Parks Department in New York, and a pavilion that kind of looks at and then uh, has association with two sides of a project. This is the Paul College. It's quite an amazing building in itself. It still has uh, Edgar Allan Poe's old furniture in it. The plan also shows a sliding of a more rudimentary need for band shelves, such as bathrooms and parks uh, facilities, starting into this is a community center and display of historical facts. This window looks, frames the uh, view of uh, Paul Cottage. And roof also has this particular shape, and the park right here, they're called ravens. <coughs> ravens of uh, poem by uh, Paul. And it kind of has a falling and a falling and rising uh, metaphor to it. And entry is very discreet. You don't see a door. You're going to slip right into the, the plan. And the plan also looks like it's, it's a broken box, which is sliding in and out. And inside of the bathroom is this mosaic ball of a little portrait of the Dana Hall. And little white is a mirror in the men's room, in the women's room. So it's imperceptible. At one point, if you have a distance, you have to see, you recognize who that is. It's a, a black building, and uh, material is a uh, roof slate used for traditional New England construction. Uh, one thing, it had to be very durable, but also it has reference to a little feathering effect of radius. It's kind of this bird life, but it's very tough and rough, and uh, it's very dark uh, building, and uh, the lighting at the eve of a Roof, so it has this again the floating aspect of it. Uh, this was a very difficult project in terms of iconography. I did not want to have it in central, <laughs> and it building, but it doesn't have to be very cheerful. But it really had to have certain melancholy, sort of enigma, mysterious ideas about that. So that's actually a challenge for me 
but the outside of construction is going to be completed soon, uh, next month. Um, I will show last two projects. This was um, in Lima, Peru, this uh, finalist in a competition for Interbank, uh, corporate university in Lima, Peru, exists in Southern Hemisphere. And uh, it's in a dry climate and desert. It's very close, uh, approaching uh, uh, some of the rainforest right there is in terms of extreme climate because water is there, water evaporation, there are a lot of cloudy days, and yet it has a lot of dust and so forth. In terms of urban development, it's very dense, rapidly growing urban center. The location is uh, the red, which is not right in the center of town, it's outside, outskirts of it. And uh, it's on the edge of 80s, uh, extreme growth, housing development right here. It has a very light active uh, supermarket here, and it's, these are very poor areas. The brief of this project is that in Lima, Peru, uh, the university system is not enough to serve elite uh, graduates. They, stu they study economics, but they really cannot work in bank because there's a gap between business education, academic education, very traditional, classic, studies, and also middle uh, management people, when they study liberal arts, they still don't have enough language skills and that skills to go further, and also for entry levels in terms of basic skills and language computer, there's a lot of missing gaps. So the competition brief is that the private entity is trying to propose new type of educational system so that about three or four different type of constituents which uh, in this particular city can study together and work for a company, I mean, not work for a company, but uh, in a way, idea of urban university was the idea of brief. And Lima, Peru is in itself, has had a lot of violent crimes and people live uh, behind fences. And there's a the rapid growth of uh, uh, Indians coming to uh, look for work and uh, there are a lot of poor populations in favelas, and then, but also it has a rapidly growing economy of banking in Puma, so it has an incredible mix of different types of constituents. I think the challenge for me is to how to work through these different type of programs. These are just program sizes. It's a just big hall. This was an incredibly inexpensive site. That's why they thought of experimenting on this. And it's a real. And uh, we have a computer center, leadership center, offices. And working also with natural elements, they want to have, use as much of landscape elements. And as I mentioned, Lima Peru, the dust problem from coming from dust and building areas is planting dust. They do absorb dust and uh, use of some of the landscape elements and are uh, using some of uh, traditional uh, elements of courtyards and a very uh, bright sunlight. It's so in the sense of shading, giving the shade is uh, at most importance. But climate itself is uh, mild in terms of, it's quite mild throughout. So even though they have glass flat towers, air conditioning, if you work out the siding uh, quite uh, intelligently, there's no need for air conditioning. There's constant wind going through the site. In terms of geometry and crafts and culture, the textile is an important crafts for Peru and uh, it's a type of a very sophisticated weave and they have a system of notation and even recording of history through so not in the meetings they really did not have written culture and many of the documents left are left as weaving. So this idea of weaving in this pattern in effect was quite an important study for me to come up site and uh, studying the wind pattern and prevailing wind is quite constant throughout and traffic and urban edge uh, making very much high mass against the world and we do have to have accommodate offices so that some this is offices for making money so that it can support school there's a scientific relationship of private and working together and working with solar chart to come up with courtyard size derived from San Paolo so that with a vaccine with a type of courtyard uh, one is I mean, to do to come up with checkable matching kind of mat vertical mat type of building for maximizing light and air circulation. As I mentioned orientation, if you orient it properly
probably against the wind, it really is very active and of engagement here. And uh, we, there's a very large parking in Bangladesh, and parking takes a lot of ventilation, so solar power assisted natural ventilation scheme is part of the project. As a campus strategy, as we know in Campus Green, Columbia University, and then an inverted campus green, idea is a traditional campus that has a volumes in a field, so that a field is a space is in between, a building is a building. But this one's inversion of that, the courtyard becomes a different type of force, and then they become the spaces that unites together in the new building, the green becomes the building. And uh, we had to work with all different kinds of functions, but also to assure the security by separating them, but eventually to be able to connect them so that office building and different kinds of people, uh, administration, leadership center, or classrooms can be shared together by different constituents. So uh, it really works a series of internal different elements, technical training, Technical training eventually should be able to share the classroom, but at the same time, one should be able to separate if you want to have a separate type of autonomy for these type of functions. Okay. The recruiting center, again, people coming for jobs, you really need a places for people to come and sit with the families and then apply for jobs, and then, and then eventually they can go into a different type of classroom systems. And, and so that's a uh, we also had to do it without uh, any as little mechanical system possible, using prevailing wind currents and solar angles, integration open space, wind driven natural ventilation, and uh, also desiccant humidification by the company cooling humidification. We had to use some of our uh, waterfalls and so forth to make it a little bit cool to have dehumidification. It has this very high humidity. Uh, instead of using air conditioning systems, using elements of waterfalls and ponds to work through. And using a traditional courtyard uh, ideas and their story about the stack effect. And some of the patterning that I showed before become the facade elements which interweaves has a plants growing in it, and they become a shading device, but also at the same time, they become elements that absorb the dust, and, uh, and it just thrives in dust, actually, so that's, and uh, using a hydrophilic surfaces, again, to, uh, so that that's the self-cleaning kind of material, so that uh, glass and shiny surfaces can be cleaned by itself, so it's very simple ideas using traditional balcony, traditional, so in a sense, we interpreting of different elements into the architectural vocabulary for this particular project. I think uh, I'm starting to do housing now, and then you know, and, uh, there's various people working on many different things, but what you see uh, is a big dome in the campus, and then uh, this direction is downtown, so this site is right in the middle, the brief of a site is center of um, environmental system, but it's federation of about 15 agencies, including Syracuse University, University of Buffalo, Cornell University, Vancouver, plus uh, carrier systems, air conditioning systems, United Technologies, uh, collaboration with industry and academic together to study effects of uh, environmental systems, mostly for the quality of indoor air. So there's a proposal for urban corridors, the university in downtown, uh, ambition to have housing and arts district and so forth going through, and that's uh, where the center of it. Uh, it's a little bit away, it's not quite the corridor, but the center of that particular element to revive the idea of downtown. Now, in terms of the center, what was very important for us was that it's a building, of course, the platinum and also it had to agree is to operate on its own footprint meaning that it should manage all the water needs from its own site <coughs> using the rainwater and then it should be able to manage its own uh, energy need from its own site. At the same time we had to be able to 
use these six principles of uh, environmental climate issues, conduction, conduction, stratification, evaporation, transmission, heat radiation. These are really thermodynamics, dynamics, but that's how idea of energy systems work. They're all invisible. And one of the problems that people are having issues with climate change and energy uh, issues is that invisible issues, it's far away from it. And in a way, this building had to be demonstration, and some of the experiments should be visible, understandable to the public. It's about the weather, it's about the change of phase state from a liquid to solid. And approach is very simple. We demonstrate optimal use of daylight, use of natural ventilation, multi tunnel shading devices, natural cooling resources. Um, this is a function of it, the tail of labs. They have material labs as testing labs, really certified material labs, and also they have water channel testing, like a wind tunnel, but it's smaller. And uh, also it has biofuel labs, so there's visible uh, labs. And uh, it has classrooms and galleries and offices. And interstitial spaces where they put in the testing different type of air conditioning systems or ventilation systems. Beta Labs is testing the mechanical systems, so metrics of quantity. TIEQ Labs is indoor environmental quality labs. They have people in it. They're testing the effect of humans. I assure you they're not torturing people, but there are human subjects in there being tested. And one of the reasons is that the scientists call it Holy Grail. This project has been going on for four years, and it's going to open in December. They call it Holy Grail about indoor uh, environmental quality is that what they're testing is beyond sustainability, beyond energy use, but it's about quality of environment and testing for productivity of human behavior. Uh, this center was conceived before the policy change. We still don't have a real complete policy change in terms of encouraging environmental, environmental responsible buildings. And uh, scientists said that the best way to demonstrate that the good design, environmentally responsible design, can be feasible and people will invest in it is to prove that something such as better air uh, management systems, lighting systems, uh, ventilation systems improve productivity, which is that in any any typical office buildings, biggest investment is in the salaries. It's really not really in terms of buildings. And uh, there has been studies done that if you would improve productivity by 1%, it pays in average for the entire energy bill. So if you improve uh, ventilation systems, control of temperature systems, you can easily, in Massachusetts studies, improve productivity by 1% to 2%. If you improve lighting systems, it can improve up to 7%. So it's always, it doesn't sound big, but if you can imagine on the exception it's getting a lot of money, like Goldman Sachs, 7% is a huge amount of money. So the idea is that if that's a formula, then, then people start investing in good design, and then in terms of much more sophisticated system of environmental systems. So that's the goal for this video, Holy Grail, and worked with about 40 different people, the scientists in Syracuse and Cornell, everybody had something to say about it, but it really unmanageable group. Everything had to be modeled and monitored and simulated before we get into this building. But this building also had to use the uh, uh, standard materials, nothing exotic, uh, quite inexpensive, and then uh, also to be able to operate on its own feet on the site. It has gallery spaces so public can come in and take a look at what's going on. Um, sections and uh, we just have different kind of uh, passive solar heating. We looked at snow storage. We studied that. Uh, Syracuse also snows a lot, but Syracuse is located because it has also extreme cold and extreme heat. The summertime it could be 40 degrees, wintertime it could be minus 20, and they snow a lot like in Buffalo. So with their snow accumulations, they can cool their own systems. Um, but it turns out with your phone, it's much more efficient and less expensive. So we chose different kind of, we have whistles, vents, and different kind of menu to choose from. But uh, we ended up choosing different systems. And 
geothermal wall field, so we had to go through study about the metrics and uh, daylighting. We every thing, architectural thing, had to go through this testing. But so that you know, we have some paradigm for it. Rather, architects can use it to test and monitor, continue monitor the performance. So every single thing, including the sun systems and uh, solar panel systems, they are all prototypes. So they keep changing it. So this is essentially what you call living lab this particular building. When you see the systems, uh, instead of a floor, it's heating system, it had hydroponic type of cooling and heating. Uh, like a uh, buffalo building, it operates on uh, natural convection, so it's just uh, heat uh, convection of cold air coming down and hot air uh, coming up. So that's the kind of uh, systems that works out very efficiently. It doesn't need a fan. Units or use of electricity, uh, uh, collecting rainwater, this site is enough so that all the uh, rainwater use and uh, all the bathroom needs is taken care of, the collection of rainwater, rainwater used for irrigation or landscape. And uh, again, natural ventilation reduces power energy, so uh, it's monitoring the pollutants. Air yeah, is not polluted outside. Also, it's right next to the highway. It's not too noisy. Green light goes up in people's computers, so they can actually work the system. So most of the time, you can operate in natural ventilation. Um, or what I think is mechanical behind this place with ventilation. So we roof, Excel staff, PVRA. So these are the kind of, how do I say, many of whistles and things. But also, we had to go through different how much wind is going to produce what. Wind turbines are tiny little wind of things. And the building is cheap so that it's actually harvest the maximum amount of wind on this particular site. Uh, this little wind turbine only gives you 10%. But biomass cogeneration, if you use that, you get 93% of the electrical energy supply. So uh, when you add them all up, you generate, you're selling back electricity to the grid in fact for this building. And that's one of the things we have to prove that. And um, these are the uh, exhaust which is built in so that you actually get be better, more natural ventilation and helping to ventilate labs, which is uh, incredibly mechanically heavy in terms of its demand. Uh, but we did pick and choose different types of menu because it's limited budget for this building, so that's the final met uh, metrics for its performance now, but it changes as the system they bring changes as it is. Um, I think one of the most interesting things for me for this building is yes, we had to go through this incredible calculation simulation, and they will continue to monitor the building, but changing the paradigm from sustainability of a building to suggest about operation of energy use and so forth, and going beyond that to really monitor the quality of the environment and a shifting idea into a building arts into something a little bit more than just doing the lead, but in terms of not only performance of building, but how it works with the quality of the environment of everyday human beings. I think that's something we tend to ignore a lot because we just think of buildings as hard fact and hard material, but we really think, don't think too much about spatial implication of as, as we see it. So in terms of, we talked about effect of daylight, and that's something scientists and, and we were really working through that type of layer, type of reflection, and how much light, how little light, and degree of what would be optimum environment, that's the kind of thing. Yes, it's a building, but what you, this tangible aspect is something we are able to study for this building and to be able to demonstrate. It's, in, it's, under stand, uh, yeah, it's under construction right now, um, and uh, I think they're occupying.